I think that my voice I found in theater, but that was in the comfort of an imaginary world. I think I found my real voice, you know, with the history makers and hearing other people's stories. And you can't touch greatness and not be impacted by it. I can't even begin to tell you how how very blessed I feel that I was able to do this work before I left this earth. The work is very important to me that the work live on and that we're relevant for the child who's not yet born. This is the Visible Voices Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Risa Lewis. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Juliana Richardson. Juliana is an American Harvard-trained lawyer and the founder and executive director of The History Makers. The History Makers is a nonprofit preserving archival collections of African-American video oral histories. Before founding The History Makers in 1999, Richardson was a cable television executive and corporate lawyer. When we get to the conversation, we're giving a bit of background on The History Makers, and Juliana is sharing what spurred her to creating this most important archive. Juliana Richardson, thank you so much for joining me on the Visible Voices podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Risa. It's a pleasure. Today, we're going to be speaking about you, your professional journey, and specifically the history makers. You've said that for 24 years, you've been 24-7, conducting now over 3,500 interviews in 413 cities and towns. The information, the stories are being stored at the Library of Congress with now a digital archive by Carnegie Mellon. Therefore, this content is available worldwide. Yes, that is very much the case. Uh, What began at my dining room table with me without a job and really at a personal crossroads about what I was going to do and how I was going to move forth in the world at that point. This marvelous project really came to me. And I, you know, I'm pleased with our progress, but, you know, we always, you know, when you start a project, you know, you think of all the things you haven't done. And so we have a long list ahead of us. Yeah. You've described this sense of urgency that, you know, we've lost the 1700s, the 1800s. We cannot afford to lose the 1900s. Can you speak a little bit more about the urgency of this work? It's really urgent. It's the only thing I think about. I mean, I started out with telling people stories, but then I found out several things along the way. I found out that our nation's libraries, museums, and archives really do not have Black people in them. And in addition to that, there's a lot of racism you know, literature, let's say just even reflective of the times, you know, that were historic times. And so I began to see the correlation between preservation and value, you know, because you preserve uh, what has value, you throw away what doesn't. And so if we don't save the 20th century, because the 20th century and the 19th century Every Black person, no matter where you find them in the world, is either an indentured or enslaved state. It's the 20th century that we see tremendous progress, you know, fighting, a lot of fighting, but a lot of progress. And so the 21st century, the thing is, is we're seeing retrenchment in this early part of the 21st century. And retrenchment that those who live through the modern day civil rights museum are a little often very perplexed by. Yeah. I'm going to read for listeners that are getting to know you and want to know more at this point in the conversation on the history makers. The history makers represents the single largest archival project of its kind since the recording of former slaves during the WPA period of the 1930s. The purpose of this archive is to educate and to show the breadth and depth of this important American history. And that's key right there. This is American history as told by the first person to highlight the accomplishments of individual African-Americans across a variety of disciplines to showcase those who have played a role in African-American led movements and or organizations and to preserve this material for years and generations to come 
creating a priceless collection of 15,000 to 20,000 of recorded African-American testimony. That's her goal. I mean, I want to essentially do for the Black community what Spielberg did for the Jewish community. I mean, we have, it's just so little, you know, I feel that we're really having to teach both inside the Black community and outside about the Black community. The Black community doesn't really even know itself. And that is resonated in the larger community. And I just, you know, there's so many things that I find curious, like, We were interviewing a gentleman early in the project whose family founded a Supreme Life Insurance Company, which was a black insurance company back, you know, at the turn of the century and lasted actually through the early, I would say, 1960s. And he had a picture of his aunt and his uncle aboard the QE2 going to England in the early 1900s. We don't think of these things. And we think of them as sort of one-offs. We also don't think of slavery. You know, when we think of slavery, you think of the antebellum South. Now we see now, you know, places like, you know, Brown, uh, where you went, and Ruth Simmons being very groundbreaking in there because we, we have the others, Harvard coming out, Columbia has come out. Yale's about to come out in February. You know, that David Blight is doing a major book on each of those institutions' slave ancestry and legacies. And sort of as a Maya Copa, but the thing is, is that I really don't want to get into the whole thing of guilt and shame because that is what has prevented, I believe, this history and coming out. You know, I didn't want to be ashamed because I, you know, my ancestors were slaves. And then the white community doesn't want to feel guilty and the others are sort of standing along the side of the lines. But yet if we don't talk about it, if we don't learn, learn from the past, learn from mistakes, how do we expect to change and progress? You have what I will call your aha moments. At the age of nine, you had an aha moment when you were sitting in a classroom in Newark, Ohio essentially all white, and everybody was going around and talking about their ancestry and their history. And that was an aha moment for you. And like, why do I only know about George Washington Carver and slavery? And, you know, there's got to be more to my history. Your next aha moment was you were a sophomore at Brandeis and you were doing work on the Harlem Renaissance at the Schomburg Center in New York City. Are there any other aha moments, either something you've had recently or any pivot moments that you're like, this is it? Yeah. Yeah, there was early in the project because I often long for those early days, you know, when people didn't really know what I was doing and I was left to my own devices. And so in the early days, I was going to interview a man named Colonel Bill Thompson. And I'm really questioning myself as I'm on the way to the interview because I'm thinking he's not well-known and we need well-known people to make people aware of us and to give us credibility. And so I knock on his door. He has literally prepared for us for four days and he has boxes from the Tuskegee Airmen. It turns out he was the chief documentarian of the Tuskegee Airmen. In fact, there are many of his objects that are in the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. as we speak. And he sat me down and he said, do you know of the Golden 13? I said, Colonel Thompson, I've never heard of the Golden 13. He said, well, there are four left living in this country and one lives upstairs and he wants to talk to you also. So the Golden 13 were the Navy's version of the Tuskegee Airmen. But he, you know, when I interviewed that Golden 13, he really hated the Navy. He didn't have anything positive to say. So that led to, you know, being with General Colin Powell, and I was trying to get him to do an interview with us. Of course, I'm seated next to General Powell, who would, you know, let go of that opportunity, and he was very politely telling me no. But he told me of the Montfort Point Marines, and I was having him literally write that out because I had never heard of them. So I think, you know, that was a ha-ha moment. Those ha-ha moments and the moments I'm talking about, which really resonates through all of our interviews. It's the discovery process. 
it's almost like each interview is a little box. And you think you may know what's in the box, but you find out there's something different in the box. And it's that process of discovery that I really, really, really love. I'm Dr. Reese E. Lewis, dropping in to tell you about a book that Dr. Adair Landry and I wrote. It's called Microskills, Small Actions, Big Impact. It's a business self-help book being published in April of 2024 by HarperCollins. We believe every future goal, complicated task, and healthy habit can be broken down into simple, measurable, and tiny skills that you can practice and then excel by removing obstacles, overcoming assumptions, and maximizing your potential at work and in life. You can pre-order it now. Go to bookshop.org, amazon.com, or wherever you buy your books. You've spoken about kind of pivoting the story controlling the narrative from the Black community and Black history being valueless to valueful, interviewing both well-known and unsung. And I understand that sort of tension of, is someone a name that people will recognize? And sort of here on the Visible Voices, this resonates because I amplify voices both known and unknown. And there's a lot of known voices that you have captured. And one story that struck me was your story of Eartha Kitt and how when she came with her daughter, she was ill. And I had a very similar circumstance where I was interviewing a woman named Robin Gunther, who was a health design architect. And it was like, I knew she was giving me her last interview, her last story, her testimony. And it struck me that you had that same feeling when you sat with her as a kid. I had heard that she had been ill. But we honored her in an evening with her as a kid. And there's a whole story behind how I think in many ways she chose us. And it was very important to her that Gwen Eiffel do the interview. And I was saying, Gwen Eiffel's not going to come to Chicago. And we gave a whole litany of people. And they came back and they kept saying Gwen Eiffel. And Gwen Eiffel came. But when she came that evening, Eartha Kitt's legs when she entered that stage, went all the way up. She had a split up to her thigh. And she was marvelous that evening. But, you know, when I got into the edit room, this is for our PBS programs that we interviewed her. I was trying for the last scene where she raised her glass. And what I did not know, she was crying. And it was literally four months later she died. And she died on Christmas Day when the song that she's known for is Christmas Baby. I would say that I felt that we were chosen by her. Yeah. She knew and she was intentional about that. She was intentional. Yeah. It's, um, that yeah. gives me the, that gives me the chills really, yeah. you know, because now we're her digital repository for her whole collection. Yeah. And I've gotten to know her daughter and, you know, the fact that they would entrust us with her papers is like, it's wonderful. Yeah. I want to speak a little bit about you. Let's turn the spotlight on you. You were born in 1954 in Duquesne, Pennsylvania, slash right near Pittsburgh. And then your family moved to Newark, Ohio. You attended university at Brandeis, where you studied theater and American history. You went on to complete law school at Harvard. And after that, the different positions you held, be it in law, be it in cable television, be it in production, being in like online shopping network, all of these combined to create the storyteller, the archivist, the oral historian that is Juliana Richardson. Really, all roads have led to where we are now. I mean, every part of that. And and I'll tell you that people often, they're with me, but when they hear Home Shopping Network, as we so I started the nation's law, second one of two regional home shopping networks, you literally hear breaks go on people's ear, you know, in their heads. But all roads have led me uh, to where I am. You know, it would took my father to really make me think that in Brandeis, it was theater you know, which is storytelling and American studies, which is what we're doing. And then I ran these local cable channels and was C-SPAN's local production arm. And C-SPAN had a whole process, you know, like they would pay production crews 
if you did the work well, if you didn't, you didn't. But that showed me how you could use regional crews around. We've done some of that, that we've kept that small. And then I think my law degree really helped because not only the research, but trying to think through all the legal issues and ethics issues, I feel a very strong sense of ethics. And then there's the fundraising. I mean, it's different. I had served on a nonprofit board. That's a much different thing Mm -hmm. than starting a nonprofit. With all these interviews, with all these oral histories, what themes have emerged and what would you say has helped fuel, if you can name some things that have stood out, people's success? Okay, I want to say that people, and I was trying to remind a group of students at Yale the other day, that people just don't shoot out from the mother's womb as successful. Um, So people come from all, we have all kinds of stories of communities. This is not a theme. I'll go to the themes, but One of the things that really strikes me are the communities that raise people up. The other day, I got very teary-eyed as I was interviewing the president of Oberlin. Her name is Carmen Twilley Amber. And that's a historic university because that's the first integrated university where Black people weren't able to attend in the the mid-1800s. You know, when she started talking about her family, It reminded me of my family and the really, you know, very strong, what I call American values, hard work, parents focusing on education. It's just that I started to get teary eyed about the communities that raised us up, the role of church and and all of that. There's a lot of things of, you know, hard work and determination and overcoming odds. But I don't want that to also be more predominant than the very unique storylines that sometimes we come across. There's Catherine Dunham, who I interviewed early in the project, and her legs were insured by Lloyds of London when she starred in Cabin in the Sky. She literally took a dance troupe all around the world with no foundation funding because that wasn't even available. And her daughter, who had grown up only in hotels, really did not like her mother. And I was able to talk and interview her daughter on one trip there. It's all these things. And what I really believe that out of this quilt work of stories will emerge a new and more accurate history. Mm -hmm. You have discussed a bit the close working relationship you have with the Shoah Foundation, and you mentioned Steven Spielberg. I learned these numbers from you, 52,000 Holocaust survivors recorded in five years. And in anticipation of the interview, they would ask for a 40-page questionnaire to be completed. And that was very instructive, educational, eye-opening to me, the preparation asked of the people that are featured. And I'd like to know a little bit more about your process when someone's invited and they agree to be a part of the History Makers. I want to say that my trip out to Shoah Foundation, when it was sort of tying up the initial part of the interview process, I think they've grown to 55,000 interviews now, but they were uh, right next to DreamWorks on the Universal lot and trailers. And they did have that questionnaire. And so I had to figure out what we were going to do because a 40-page questionnaire was not going to (laughs) work. And my name wasn't Steven Spielberg. Neither was it Oprah Winfrey. And so we did a lot of sort of shell games at the beginning, not intentionally, but research is really, really important to us. And so uh, we'll go into an interview with a 30 to 60 page outline on a person's life. And the, the process of contextualization is really important to us. We divide our interviews into, I would say, three parts. You know, it's really trying to trace what they know about their family background. And 50%, no, a lot and 50% don't know much at all. And then one of the questions I've made mandatory is what sight, smells, and sound remind you of your childhood? Because in the early part, we're really trying to reawake memory, to bring them back to a point of memory. Most 
of our subjects have never sat for an oral history interview and never talked about themselves for a concentrated period of time. And then we move forward, you know, through education and then career. And the career is really, you know, where the contextual information is really important so they can map themselves. And then we ask philosophical questions about, you know, their hopes and dreams for the Black community. What would they do if they were starting out at another point in time? And you know what I was intrigued by? This is a little going off, but Lonnie Bunch, who I was able to interview just recently again, and I had interviewed him when he was head of the Chicago History Museum. He's now the 14th director of the Smithsonian. In his interview, this is before any appointment to the National African American Museum, he says he wants to be the first African-American director of the Smithsonian. So when I went in with that, you know, all excited, he was like, I I can't believe I said that. So anyway. Juliana, you are 69 years young. How old do you feel? I don't feel that old. It's the craziest thing. But, you know, I've been telling a lot of people that a lot of my experience has been with people, you know, in their 80s and 90s. Very vibrant. In fact, we're interviewing someone who actually knew people like W.B. Du Bois, and he's 102 and writing books, and he's very lucid. And we've been doing him, and his name is Edmund Gordon, and a very, very accomplished African-American sociologist. But I'm quite influenced. I remember the first time that we were going to interview someone 90, and, and they said that they had an appointment. I go, appointment? What is a 90-year-old doing with an appointment? But no, um, no, I feel really young. It's yeah. so horrible. I ask my guests, and now I ask you, when did you realize you had a voice, and when did you start using your voice? I think that. My voice, I found in theater, but that was in the comfort of an imaginary world. I think I found my real voice, you know, with the history makers and hearing other people's stories. And you can't touch greatness and not be impacted by it. I can't even begin to tell you how, how very blessed I feel that I was able to do this work before I left this earth. The work is very important to me that the work live on and that we're relevant for the child who's not yet born. The Risa Wrap Up. Special thanks to Juliana Richardson for joining me in conversation. A conversation I loved. Three take-home points, audience. Number one, African-American history is American history. Number two, all of us have stories. All of us have histories. Let's continue to work to collect these stories, collect these oral histories to really put together all that is America. And number three, get to know people, people whose life's passion and work is mission driven, mission driven like the history makers and the work of Juliana Richardson. That's all I have for you this week, audience. See you next time. The Visible Voices podcast amplifies voices both known and unknown, discussing topics of healthcare, equity, and current trends. We are a production of the People's Media Network. Our team includes Dr. Juliano DeCorto and me, Dr. Risa E. Lewis. Please find me on social media at Risa E. Lewis and through the website, thevisiblevoicespodcast.com. If you like the podcast, please rate and review us. Share the podcast with a friend today. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, to be continued.